Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Kostyushka Foundation's online lecture, huddled in full sentences, Poetic Worlds of Eva Lipska, presented by Jarosław Anders. My name is Eva Zadvorna. I'm Director of Cultural Affairs at the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us here today. The lecture that you are going to hear in a moment is the third and final part of the discussion about Poland's new wave poets. The first one, titled My Country's Other Names, was presented on February the 4th, and the other, Touched by History, Politics and Poetics of the Polish New Wave Writers in the 1970s, uh, was presented on April the 8th. And these both past webinars are now streaming on the Foundation's YouTube channel, so you can go there and uh, watch the, the previous episodes in this series. Uh, and now also for those of you who are joining us here today for the first time, I'd like to introduce our speaker, a writer, translator, and editor, Jarosław Anders. Jarosław Anders is the author of Between Fire and Sleep, Essays on Modern Polish Poetry and Prose. He's also the author of numerous articles published in the New York Review of Books, The New Republic, the Los Angeles Times Book Review, and other publications. He has translated several books from English into Polish and from Polish into English. And in the past, he served as a writer and broadcaster for The Voice of America. And he worked in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor of the US Department of State. This lecture is organized and hosted together with the Polish program at Hunter College CUNY run by Dr. Małgorzata Pośpiech, who is joining us for this webinar. Dr. Pośpiech is a writer, documentary filmmaker, journalist, published translator, and a photographer. She will lead a discussion after the lecture, so if you have any questions, please ask them using the Q&A feature, and after the presentation by uh, Jarosław Anders, we will get back and we will have the discussion. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Pośpiech, Mr. Anders, welcome again, mm -hmm. and Mr. Anders, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and many thanks to the organizers and hosts of this event. Um, it is, uh, as Eva said, the third and uh, the time that we meet, meet to talk about uh, a generation of Polish poets born at the end or around the end of the Second World War. Uh, on the previous two uh, occasions, we talked about the generation as, as a whole, especially the, the part of the generation that uh, came to be known as Generation 68 or uh, the New Wave, maturing in, in the highly politicized uh, and socially uh, restless 1970s. Uh, the most prominent members of this group uh, are Richard Krynicki, Stanisław Walańczak, Julian Kornhauser, Adam Zagajewski, and Eva Lipska, who is also frequently uh, placed um, in this company. I did it in my previous talks, but with a caveat that uh, while showing some similarities with the others, she has always been a separate uh, phenomenon, uh, a world or other worlds uh, apart. So today we are going to focus on uh, Eva Lipska. Before I start, I would like to provide a footnote. Throughout my talk, um, I'm going to use mostly brief quotes from different English translations of Lipska's poetry. <clears throat> Instead of acknowledging each time, I would just like to say that I'm using mostly uh, translations by <clears throat> Barbara Plebanek and Tony Howard from the book Poet, Criminal, and Madman, uh, published by Forest Books in 1991. Um, and also translations by uh, Robin Davidson and Elżbieta Nowakowska from the book, more recent book, um, The New Century, uh, Northwestern University Press, 2009. Some translations by Magnus Krinsky that appeared in, uh, in the Polish Review in uh, 1980, and some translations by Joanna Trzeciak, who's the translator of Tadeusz Różewicz and Wisława Szymborska among uh, many uh, others. Uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, our, some of the translations will be, will be also mine done very quickly for the purpose of this, of this lecture. Uh, so let's talk about Eva Lipska and uh, try to place her somewhere against the background of her generation. And trying is probably uh, all we can hope for because her poetry poses unique challenges 
uh, to readers and critics alike. Uh, I have never met uh, the poet in person. Um, those who do know her tell us that uh, she collects or used to collect uh, at some time uh, old keys, which were hanging in various uh, places in her apartment, making uh, their guests wonder where are the locks they do or used to do uh, open. And a critic of her poetry sometimes has a similar feeling um, at the end of his labors. Uh, we hold an, hold an elaborate key, but uh, have we really found the lock? Uh, Eva Lipska was born in 1945 in Krakow. She studied in, uh, in the Krakow Academy of Fine Arts, uh, but as she says, uh, she uh, never painted professionally. Uh, she started publishing her poems in newspapers um, and magazines in 1964 when she wasn't even 20. Uh, her first volume of poetry, titled simply Wiersze, Poems, appeared in 1967. Uh, for a while, she would simply number her volumes, uh, the second collection of poems, the third collection of poems, all the way uh, to the fifth collection of uh, poems, and later her books had proper titles. Uh, she worked as uh, a poetry editor in literary magazines and in a highly respected uh, crack of publishing house uh, Wydawnictwo Literackie or WL. She became friends with Wisława Szymborska, who had a uh, great influence on her in her formative years. She traveled, she spent a few months in the United States uh, participating in the international writing program at the University of Iowa. Um, after the fall of communism, she became uh, the head uh, of the Polish Institute in Vienna, Cultural Institute where she befriended uh, and collaborated with uh, the Austrian uh, writer and Nazi hunter, uh, born in Poland, Simon Szymon Wiesenthal. Uh, poetry has always been her main vehicle, but she also wrote prose, essays, uh, one short drama. In her later years, she became uh, writing a series of witty, quirky newspaper feuilletons, which she calls her uh, surrealist uh, political uh, short stories. Uh, she wrote at least one uh, science fiction story that I know that was published in, a, in, in the Polish popular magazine called Fantastica. Uh, she wrote songs, poetic songs, in the European tradition. In uh, 2012 and 2013, she published two books of short poetic prose uh, in, in the epistolary uh, form titled Dear Ms. Schubert and Love, Dear Ms. Schubert. She is the author of a short novel, Sefer, about a Viennese Jewish psychotherapist who travels to Krakow to learn about an episode from his late father's life. In her writing, her interviews, her letters, uh, she appears as a person who is very much an intellectual, well read, not only in belles lettres, but also in philosophy, history, cultural theory, also interestingly, in popular science and technology. Uh, I'm telling about all that because it presents to me at least a portrait of a personality, a person that is very active, lively, curious about the world, uh, fascinated with ideas. And we should keep this in mind while reading her poetry, which is, as we shall see, mostly melancholy, even pessimistic, if also a highly uh, ironic and witty. It is a paradox, uh, one of many we encounter uh, dealing with Eva Lipska. The date of her birth, 1945, she is the exact contemporary of Adam Zagajewski and of the publication of her first uh, poetic volume, uh, seem to link her to the new world, uh, new wave crowd. Uh, she is often discussed, reviewed, anthologized together with them. Some critics say that uh, her first volume uh, actually started the generational phenomenon, the poetic phenomenon. Uh, there are poems in this volume that can be read as a kind of um, manifesto of the generation born after the war, still in its shadow, uh, growing up in this strange indefinite period called the little stabilization uh, we talked about uh, previously. The generation that knew that uh, things are not right, we are, not, we are living under communism, we're not free, but the worst of communist oppression, the period of Stalinism, seemed to be over. 
uh, one could live, even enjoy life to a degree. Western ideas were filtering in, intellectual discussions in private first, but also gradually in our uh, schools and our universities were becoming interesting. Uh, it was possible to pretend that we live in a more or less normal world, but we periodically had to wake up to the uh, unpleasant, true and reality. One of the poems in this first volume is titled characteristically, We. Uh, it speaks about uh, a generation that is wide open, uh, comfortable, reading Sartre and telephone books, growing up sheltered in peaceful flower pots, but aware that uh, they are, in a sense, uh, the children of a nightmare. And uh, their presence, that means their birth, was supposed to cure, to exercise this nightmare from the memory uh, of their parents. This generation uh, have a nagging uh, sensation that they are really extras in a drama that is not fully theirs. Uh, there is even envy, some envy towards those who experienced it all directly, who went through the war in cavalry boots, as she writes. We're not allowed to be heroes, she suggests, uh, yet we are supposed to carry the mutilated, bullet-ridden uh, memory of our elders. There are several poems in this first uh, uh, volume that signal a sense of belonging to a certain a generation in a specific time. But unlike in the uh, other new wave poets, for Lipska, this generation is not defined, at least not openly, by political conditions, uh, but rather by memories in the past. Uh, most poems in this and uh, several uh, fo following volumes uh, uh, leave uh, the collective uh, generational uh, dimension aside and a focus on, um, uh, on the issues of the individual, uh, the motives of loneliness, uh, displacement, journey, and especially on human uh, vulnerability and uh, mortality. And here I'm going to reach for the first key, a very old one, in the form of the myth of death and the maiden. You know the story uh, very well from many uh, literary treatments, both high and low. A young woman is captured or imprisoned or seduced or poisoned by a darkness and death, like Persephone by Hades. Uh, and then she manages to break out, sometimes only partly. Persephone still must spend uh, half of the year with Hades as his queen of the underworld, but returns in the spring, like now, to bring us growth, color, uh, and life. It is always tricky to uh, refer to a writer's biography and seek its projections into, into uh, the writer's work. But in Lipska's case, it is rather inevitable. As a young person, she was very ill. It was a life-threatening disease. She rarely speaks about it in much detail, but she once uh, remarked uh, in an interview that for six years, a bomb was ticking inside me. Uh, and then she continues, difficult experiences at the beginning of my life made me aware of the fragility of life. And at the same time, they distanced me from life so that it assumed a different, a deeper uh, dimension. Distance is the key word here. A distance from life is also a distance from death. Uh, one could expect from a young, sensitive, talented person forced to live under the threat of death, uh, one would ex expect a kind of lyrical outpouring of grief, complaint, even rage, something that we refer as confessionalism in literature, but not in Lipska. From the very beginning, uh, she decided to look at death, to use Zbigniew Herbert's famous phrase, with a calm and very clear eye. That means she approached the subject ironically. The term irony and ironic is used in literature, in literary discussions all the time and in many different uh, meanings, none of them particularly precise. Uh, I'm using it here, I hope, in the most general and broad sense of uh, looking at something from an elevated 
position from above, from with detachment, from a locus of superiority, not as someone directly entangled in the drama. It's a tough act psychologically and poetically. Lipska succeeds in it, and we'll see later through her uh, very inventive uh, characteristic use of the poetic, poetic language, elaborate metaphors and figures of speech. Death gets metaphorized and depersonalized gradually, progressively. They are poems, especially in the first volumes, that seem to hesitate between subjectivity and objectivity, between the confessional and the uh, ironic uh, modes. But they never slip into melodrama, never cross the border of uh, sentimentality. Emotion is present, but is highly controlled and restrained. In one of the first poems um, about death, the narr narrator, narrator instructs someone, a friend, a lover, maybe herself, to be, keep quiet about it, to be careful uh, with words. Don't wait for me. Lock, lock up the trees. They'll understand. They are made for it. Don't tell the leaves, no need to bother. Tell it to the wind, it'll shrug its shoulders. And then only at the very last and the very end of the poem, in the last two verse, verses, after the series of soft, vegetative, uh, almost pastoral images, she hints, she, she hints at something terrible, hits us with a blunt force. The night's too steep, so don't wait for me. I won't come today. Today, I have to die. Um, as we move chronologically forward, uh, the question of death increasingly loses its character of direct experience and becomes a philosophical question. Following uh, Montesquieu uh, and philosophers of existence from Kierkegaard, Heidegger to Sartre and Camus, the poetic voice ponders the constant presence of death in life. We start dying the moment we are born. Every moment of our life is a moment taken away from the life. We cannot truly live life if we do not understand and accept that truth. Montesquieu tells us that we should learn death while living. So she writes, learn death, whom the gods love die young. Learn death early, quiz yourself, quiz yourself back to life. Uh, in a poem, questions at a poetry reading the audience is clearly put off by the poet's dark vision. Uh, don't you have any hope, they ask? You frighten us. Why the black sky? Why time shut down? Do you have faith or don't you? You frightened us. We run from you. I try to stop them. They fly straight into the flame. Um, in the fifth collection, we find several poems that seem to speak about the death of someone else, someone close to the speaking voice. Um, in a poem entitled uh, Last Words, uh, the speaking voice seems to be relieved that she was not there um, at the death of the friend, uh, that the last words were not exchanged between them. The last words could have disappointed us touch upon the subject too directly. They could restlessly have stacked on the future tense. Uh, in Lipska's poems, the dead and the living sometimes exchange places. And it is hard to say who is the dead and who is the living. Uh, a poem, uh, The Day of the Living, describes um, presumably All Saints Day, on November the 1st, which in Poland is no as Święto Zmarłych, Day of the Dead. Um, people go to cemeteries to light lights and put fresh flowers on the graves of their dear ones. Cemeteries on the, on the day actually look very lively, very even festive. They are like lights, flowers, crowds, family reunions, a social event. Um, in the poem, the dead decide to return the courtesy and visit or revisit the living. On the day of the living, the dead visit the graves 
of the living. Light neon lights and dig around the chrysanthemums of aerials on the roofs of multi-storied mausoleums with central heating. After which they take elevators down to their daily work to death. It's a rather spooky image, but the real question in this poem is, uh, seems to be who is really the dead? Isn't it us living in mausoleums of apartment blocks under the ghostly uh, neon lights and wasting our precious time watching television? Um, and since philosophers tell us that we're dying from the moment of our birth, there is a, a motive of envy towards those who are already dead because they are at least no longer dying. Uh, in one poem, the speaker lists all the calamities that uh, she has avoided uh, in her life and concludes with a surprising, I wasn't saved at all. I am alive. And uh, another poem admonishes a survivor of one such calamity. Why are you so glad you survive? What will you do with your death that survived? That This sounds like, you know, the ultimate pessimism, the rejection of existence that means of everything. Uh, but this kind of pessimism, existence is a nightmare, it's better to be dead than alive, it's still better to never have been born, uh, is a recurrent motive in our culture. And by our culture, I mean human culture, because it can be found in practically uh, all cultural uh, circles, all civilizations. It can be traced to the so-called Hellenic pessimism, whom the gods love their young, the chorus in Oedipus at Colonus by Sophocles sings these very words. Not to be born at all is best, next best, when born, with least delay to trace the backward way. Uh, we find it in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes, Koheleth. Uh, <clears throat> all is vanity and the dead are luckier than the living. It is echoed, of course, in Hamlet's to be, and not to, or not to be, uh, it is continued by modern pessimists, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Joran, existentialist philosophers. So this complaint is a part of our culture, a universal arch archetype, one could say, which is strange because philosophically speaking, it is a nuclear option. It leaves nothing to believe in. We're done here, <laughs> goodbye. Except that, and I'm sure that the author is not unaware of that, we are still here. Uh, the world goes on, cultures, civilizations, individual human beings go on. We reach the pre precipice and then we step back, at least in 99% of cases. It is possible that uh, what we have here is a mental ritual that is supposed to bring catharsis, like in, in Greek tragedies. Uh, paradoxically, it gives us courage and sense of freedom Albert Camus suggests in his The Myth of Sisyphus. And I believe this is exactly the role such statements play uh, in Lipska's poetry. A Polish critic, uh, Grzegorz Olszyński, says in his book, Śmierć Udomowiona, Domesticated Death, that death in Lipska's writing is not lessened by any traditional device, philosophy, religion, the belief that uh, the labors of our life will survive us and be a lasting monument to our momentary existence here. But because of the repetitions, iterations, making it a subject of various rhetorical uh, exercises, it gets domesticated, demystified, rid of the element of dread. Domesticated and demystified, well, at least in part. Um, this is a good way of putting it. Another way of putting it is to say that in Lipska's writing, the monster, the shadow, the cold breath of nothingness becomes a concept, an idea, a puzzle we can play with, a subject of irony, even humor. Uh, it becomes intellectually and aesthetically exciting. And excitement is, by definition, uh, the opposite of despair. Lipska was once asked in an interview whether she considers herself a person living in a state of existential despair. And she responded in the negative. No, she's not. 
And <clears throat> sorry, in my view, this can be seen in her, in her writing. Her poems are melancholy, pessimistic, but not desperate. Uh, the dominant tone is uh, some form of stoicism, uh, which is also a form of irony, of putting yourself a tiny bit above, looking down uh, on the human drama or human comedy, if you prefer. So one way or another, the maiden wins. Uh, other recurrent uh, emotives in Lipska's writing are treated with the same uh, mixture of melancholy, irony, uh, and stoicism. Mm, they are motives of personal, individual life, nature, like love, relations between two persons, family. Um, but there are also meditations, uh, not unlike in her French Simborska, on uh, history, culture, the state of modern civilization. A love, friendship, closeness between two persons uh, in Lipska's poetry uh, uh, are sometimes the redeeming force. But they are usually presented uh, in a moment when uh, something is no longer all right. Something is, is already breaking up. Uh, it is becoming clear that the ideal it was supposed to be to impersonate, uh, to incorporate, uh, is gone, or perhaps never existed. Uh, the passing of time washes away colors, that's the frequent motive, dulls emotions, but sadness is usually mixed with tenderness. The tone is quiet, meditative, like in the poem uh, Plum Crumb Cake, uh, where the draft blew everything away and even the night doesn't realize when we are together. Yet the poem opens with, I pluck from your face a crumb of plum crumb cake, a tiny press of tenderness. Away from all ideas, I set it on the fine china of the page. Let it be recorded forever. Uh, there is no high drama, no rebellion, no recrimination, just melancholy and a certain softness uh, reflected in the images and, and the diction. Uh, the modern world appears overloaded with insignificant facts, with the excess of nothing, uh, as she says in one of her poems, with false values. It forces uh, us into self-deception, deprives us of our innate freedom. Uh, technology, <clears throat> It does play a role in, in this process by turning our world into a number, a process, a program, and a series of icons, symbols. She wrote several poems uh, about computers. Uh, for instance, Our Computer. Our computer lies between us. Formatted just for our quick, quick love, we open a dialogue window. A spiritual emptiness, um, invites strange ideas, extreme ideas, the racket of speeches, she says in one of her poems, that try to fill the vacuum. Uh, one of Lipska's books uh, titled 1999 is dedicated to the end of the millennium in which <coughs> just like with life and death, the continuation of the world appears sometimes even more frightening than its presumed uh, end. Uh, we are sick with the century's decline, saved only by mountain ranges of antibiotics welded with metallic grass. The valleys are overgrown with noise. I say something to you, to you all, to no one. Uh, some critics call it apocalyptic vision, uh, but in her eschatological, as in her eschatological poems um, about death, uh, the irony always saves the day. We may be heading into another catastrophe, but we may not be heading into another catastrophe. Um, in the poem December 31, 1991, uh, she writes that despite uh, all the apocalyptic predictions um, of the end of the world, the New Year's infant will scream at midnight. The sudden hawk of the wind will bend the willows, 
the compass will indicate there is no other choice. The usual drill of the hours. Um, Lipska, as we see, can focus with equal acuity on the individual human person or two persons or on the whole civilization. But for some critics, uh, something seemed to be missing, a mid-range view that would inevitably uh, include uh, a particular reality in a particular historical moment, that is Poland under communism. That was uh, the preferred perspective of her new wave colleagues, especially in the 1970s and early 80s, and we talked about it in the past. Was Ewalipska so different from them in that respect? Some say, yes, she wasn't interested in politics. Uh, she has always been interested mainly in the fundamental issues of existence, irrespective of external circumstances. Others uh, trying to fit her into the picture of her generation uh, canvas her poems for political illusions, hidden references, for certain typically new wave poetic uh, tropes. Uh, none of those uh, two uh, approaches seems to me entirely wrong. Uh, <clears throat> it is true that in the early years of her career, uh, she seemed less interested in pursuing the path of the engaged, that is politically critical poetry followed by her uh, new wave uh, uh, contemporaries. But even in her first volume, we find hints uh, that signal her awareness of belonging to a generation that was supposed to be wide open, but was in fact living under strict limitations. Um, in the second collection, she says, I can speak loudly or shout, but I have to keep silent. And she instructs her younger sister, a little sister, that before watching the skies, you must take them to the censors. In the third collection, in the poem Kogut, Rooster, two gentlemen visit the speaker to search her mind, to take fingerprints of her ideas, and finally carry her brain uh, out, presumably as a potential criminal a piece of potential criminal evidence. Uh, in yet another poem, in the same volume, a young precocious girl is spying on her nation through the window. She's very well educated. She believes she was present at the trials of Pericles' friends and does not understand why they were convicted. Those were trials uh, allegedly for impiety, lack of reverence towards gods. In the poem, Anaxagoras, the philosopher, one of those on, on trial gives her a confidential wink. Uh, in yet another poem, children playing adults, perhaps adults playing children, uh, participate in uh, party meetings and report on the parents. Her story, Living Death, published in 1979, uh, which is set in a mental asylum, was widely interpreted, including by the censors, as a political allegory. And there are elements that can be interpreted this way, but the piece can also be read as an existentialist story of a person trapped in uh, a meaningless, uh, fragmented, a repetitive cycle of, of existence. Uh, these instances, these signals, do not seem to amount to a politic, political program, um, as in they, they did in Baranjak or Zagajewski around the same time. Uh, <clears throat> but she belonged to the, to, to the generation that was already getting restless. Um, speaking about her student days, <clears throat> she says, uh, we were politicized. Uh, our window on the world were windows on the world were books and uh, radio for Europe. Now, after many years, I see those years as a spectacle in which we played, sometimes lead and sometimes sometimes supporting roles. But for a while, political concerns were clearly not her primary concerns. Uh, that started to change in the 80s. Her volume uh, a storage of Darkness, um, published in 1984 uh, in an underground publishing operation, Trechvit Pridon, it could not be published uh, officially, is considered by some uh, one of the most eloquent poetic testimonies 
um, from the time of, of martial law in Poland and placed next to, for instance, Zbigniew Herbert's uh, report from the besieged city. Uh, one of the poems is titled A Citizen of a Small Country and opens with these lines. The citizen of a small country, thoughtlessly born on the edge of Europe, is called up to contemplate freedom. As a reservist, he'd never given it a thought. He interrupts his whale's morning feed. He leaves through dictionaries. Uh, several times before he had passed through freedom with a transit visa. Sometimes he stopped for lunch and a glass of orange juice. Uh, we clearly hear here hear in, in it uh, the, the new wave uh, sound. In, in this volume, she also uses frequent extended metaphors in which the whole poem tells a story that assumes um, an allegorical uh, meaning, like Baranjak, for instance. In, in her case, for example, from the cycle, ma major breakdowns. <clears throat> A breakdown of language happened in the country. From early morning, engineers were attempting to stop the stream of words. Flooded meanings were sinking to the bottom. Words were losing their order speech became dependent on several generals. So we hear Barinczak here from uh, his morning diary or artificial respiration books, um, about which we talked um, a bit like last time. Interestingly, Lipska seems to reach this point, this new perspective, uh, which she continued in her following uh, volumes, exactly at the time when some of the main proponents of political engagement like Zagajewski or Barańczak started to move away from it. As they discovered that uh, writing uh, about political absurdity itself becomes eventually an absurdity, she makes this absurdity uh, the subject of her poems. And she continues it beyond the year 1989, practicing kind of poetic scrutiny or poetic, poetic critique of Poland, now free and democratic, not only in her whimsical uh, newspaper uh, feuilletons, columns, but also in, in, in some of her poems in which we find the familiar, familiar note of uh, melancholy and gentle disappointment with the new life. Um, in, um, in the poem, Newton's Orange, the origin, for example, we read, our country on the mother's side belongs to the East on lowlands, the coarse cloth of uniform, a salon on the outskirts. On our father's sides, Europe and the cosmetic pact, the smoothing away of wrinkles. Or in a poem from the book, uh, 2010, uh, I'm telling my country, move out, emigrate, be a foreigner for a while, then come back and live in yourself. Think it all over once again. Catch yourself in mid-flight. Uh, it should be noted, however, that uh, political uh, commentaries um, in this, if, if, if they are really uh, commentaries, uh, both during communism and after, are always very subtle and more ambiguous than in, uh, in, in the poems of her colleagues. In Lipska's poems, at least the we uh, rarely encounter elements of direct political satire, which usually calls for a measure of simplification, levity, intellectual shortcuts. In one of her interviews, she uh, is making fun of poems marching in a procession with flags and banners. Her own poems, she says, touch upon reality, but do not participate in social life. Uh, they have no such ambition. One can ask finally, um, so who is Eva Lipska, a poet of private spaces or public concerns, of eschatological meditations on life and death, um, or ruminations on history and civilization? Is she a poet, to use Zagajewski's dichotomy, of solidarity or solitude? Uh, the answer, as you may have guessed already, is all of the above. 
but not only because she shifts her attention from one subject to, to the other. Uh, what is characteristic of Slipska's vision is that many of those different themes, circles of experience are intricately linked, interlaced in a single poem. And this interlacing happens largely through her very elaborate inventive use of poetic language, metaphors, um, the whole linguistic apparatus of polysemy, to use the uh, theoretical term, which means the same words or phrases meaning different things at the same time. Um, she uses unusual syntax, merges, breaks up phraseological uh, units, um, sometimes placing them in very atypical, unexpected contexts that change or bend the meanings. We encounter expressions like, the earth will swear us, or parched by the sun to the throne and the bone, a divorced bed, eyes that open wide the bad and the good sides of the world. He complains about the climate, which recently turned bitter. <coughs> huddled in full sentences, the words are hiding. Um, she applied, um, very often she applies staggering multi-level metaphors as in vacatie Hotelu. <clears throat> Vacations in a hotel. When we read, uh, the hotel drags along like a freight train, the shabbiest hotel in the world. You can live, you can live in it, though despair, through despair, sorry, you can, yes, I'll start it one again, once again. <coughs> My throat is bothering me. Uh, the hotel drags along like a freight train, the shabbiest hotel in the world. You can live in it through despair or vacations, it's more and more difficult to write in it. Your poems suffer from paralysis. First, we have um, a hotel compared to a slow train, which is a strange juxtaposition. Then we realize that the hotel is really a hospital. And then retroactively, the train that stands for the hotel slash hospital is really a metaphor for illness. Uh, in one of the poems, we find, for instance, a very interesting phrase, a child that cried a glass to pieces, blending <clears throat> in one instant um, two images, one of a crying child and broken glass, which suggest, uh, just suggest leaving it to our imagination that there may be some connection between them. <clears throat> Those verbal games play many different roles. Uh, they serve, as I suggested earlier, a distance as a distancing tool that introduces emotional detachment um, between the speaking persona and the often disturbing subject. Uh, even an element of wit, playfulness, as when we read, for instance, about a dead person, he forgot himself to death, playing on the Polish expression, zapomnić na śmierć, to forget to death, which means simply to completely, totally forget something. Or when she speaks about a deceased friend, you were taking off from yourself when I was taking off from the Denver airport in Colorado. Sometimes she seems to craftily remove the human element um, in such phrases as uh, highways rushing with excessive speed, glasses with incurable eye disease, a stone stumbled on us. Millions of car accidents died, River, rivers drowned. But most importantly, I think, those linguistic structures connect, interweave different worlds, different areas of experience, the world of illness and the world of love, of life and death, of personal time and historical time, of exist existential anxiety and political anxiety. Um, a good example uh, is a poem uh, at the desk where the speaker seems to be at the same time at her desk writing and in a hospital undergoing a therapy. A cobalt lamp over my desk radiates the blue cells of ink. 
growing on the white paper of lungs. The illness got in the mood for writing, lumpy thoughts in the lymph nodes of sentences. Paper was put in the isolation room of the drawer. It awaits salvation. A cobalt, that means blue desk lamp, is uh, also a cobalt bomb, which is used in radiation therapy. Ink, the blood of creativity, has cells, which means it's also real blood. Uh, sheets of paper, are lungs, a desk drawer holding a poem is also a hospital room holding, imprisoning um, a patient. Uh, there is something interesting uh, happening here. In traditional metaphors, the transfer of meaning usually happens in one, one direction, from object A to object B. A river stands for time, a mountain stands for uh, a challenge, uh, etc. In Lipska's poetry, it is not uh, entirely clear what stands for what. Is ink a metaphor for blood, or is blood a metaphor for ink? Uh, is it the illness that is writing its story on, on the body of the sick person, or is it the sick person trying to describe the illness? Which, which one of those two realities uh, is primary and which is secondary? Which, which one should, should be taken as actual and which as figurative? The semantic transfer goes both ways. A similar blending of, of meanings, uh, similar bidirectional, sometimes multidirectional metaphors do occur in other uh, poets of Lipska's generation, but her use of them is, my, in my view, uh, the most elaborate and, and the most uh, intriguing. Um, so how can we situate uh, Lipska against the background of her generation? She tends to dismiss uh, any literary affinities. I never belonged to any literary group, uh, she said in an interview. With the colleagues from the new wave, we shared history, dates of birth, and friendships, perhaps also language, because we used to, we used a similar language of illusions. Uh, we can probably add to that uh, that she shared with them a sense of alienation, discomfort in the world as they inherited it, a sense of anxiety. Uh, she shared with them a deep mistrust of ideologies, doctrines, uh, systems, everything that purports to offer an illusion of uh, certainty. Um, skepticism uh, was her main thing. I believe in doubt, uh, she writes, free from the addiction to faith. Uh, a Polish critic, Magdalena rabizo -Burek, said that Lipska still follows the new wave strategy of uh, uncertainty and doubt postulated, for example, in Baranczak's book, Nieufni i Zadufani, Doubters and Believers. And she does it most consistently. Um, on the other hand, she was always a poet, perhaps a type of um, poetic sensibility who was particularly aware that there are battles uh, that the human individual faces um, in any circumstances and conditions, uh, external circumstances and conditions, and must fight uh, on her own. Uh, she possessed from the very beginning that which other members of, uh, of, of her generation, those we talked about in the previous lectures, either put aside or suppressed in their pursuit of public interests and which they, many of them practically, uh, all of them uh, discovered or rediscovered in the later stages of their careers. I would like to stop here. If we still have a minute or two, I would like to finish with a poem. Um, uh, by Eva Lipska, one of the uh, more recent poems, which is called The World. Do we still have time? Yes? Okay. So The World, we, uh, last time we talked about Adam Zagajewski's poem, Try to Praise the Mutilated World. Um, this is the world as Lipska sees it, sees it. and uh, I'm sure you'll, you notice some differences, maybe, maybe, maybe similarities as well. The World. Sometimes you are beautiful, a cosmic garment, the unearthly wardrobe of landscapes. Learned minds examine your body, researchers of elements. Someone always predicts your end. You have no close family, 
to whom will you leave all that? No, the planets may express an interest. Are you eternal? The smell of the dead season denies it. The untruth is sometimes right. I can manage without you. You haven't promised me anything after all. I don't even know whether history created us or we created history. Are we just an echo of somebody else's heart? So now I stop here uh, with a bunch of keys in my hand, hoping that they may fit a lock or two. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I really uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. It was so good to hear such a deep analysis of her poetry and your um, also the reading of the last poem. It's uh, completing our series. So I have a question about when and how you discover her poetry. Oh, <laughs> that was a long time ago. <clears throat> I think I started uh, reading poetry um, the same time, her, her poetry, the same time I started reading the poetry of the other uh, members of this generation. Um, that means when I was, when I was in, in college, I started my, my studies. Um, it was a discovery uh, of a strange kind because uh, I think I, 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 I wrote somewhere uh, that we lived in, a, those of us, uh, us who, who read poetry, um, lived in like two different poetic worlds. I was studying um, English uh, literature and, and, Ameri and American literature at that time. Polish poetry, that means Herbert, Szymborska, the new wave, was the poetry of immediate, uh, immediate reaction. It was poetry that was telling us about our own uh, articulating our own experiences, telling us that we that we are here and, and now, that we live here. And then there was poetry that we learned in the liter literature lessons, English, American literature lessons, in my case, which was this huge element of uh, verbal uh, structures that you have to um, analyze very carefully, uh, that you have to read closely, you know, and decipher. And for me, I think that, <laughs> Uh, Lipska lived on, on the border of those two worlds, uh, was a link between those two worlds. And that was, that was I think, that the discovery that you can speak about our reality in some ways and at the same time be a very universal kind of, you know, um, poetic voice that, that could fit anywhere, you know, in, 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 in the world. Uh, uh, and you know you you have to. This is a very mature poetry, and it's amazing, as I mentioned, that she started writing very young, and even her earliest poems seem very mature, both in form and in context. But you have to also mature to to realize to realize its depth. You know, my own melancholy character probably helped me to 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 realize how you know, how interesting it it really is. So that was, and I'm you know I, I followed her her writing. She's. She changes, of course. Every every volume of po po poems brings something new, but there are there are no radical changes, radical turns turns like in the case of Baranczyk or Zagajewski. She is still Lipska that you can trace, you know, through the, the motives can be traced back to to the very early earlier days. So that was my my ad adventure with 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 her poetry. Thank you. And the next next question is about Krakow. What role did Krakow play? The Krakow atmosphere, the literary life. She lived there. She has been living there, and she met Szymborska. She was friend with Szymborska. Yeah. So, um, what Krak? What is the role of Krakow? This is a trick question because you're talking to a to a War Warsawian, Warszawian. Uh, and everybody knows about the um, never-ending uh, uh, contest of egos between Warsaw and, and Krakow. Uh, I never lived in Krakow myself. I visited many times, of course. Uh, it is a place uh, that seems to be very uh, conducted to, to creativity in general and literature as, especially. Uh, if Warsaw is about 
change and flax, uh, flax track is about continuity, about certain stability, uh, tradition. And in order to be an innovator, you have to be also aware of, of a tradition as T.S. Eliot uh, tells us. So uh, I, believe, I believe that Krakow did, I mean, I don't see any direct, uh, direct uh, reflections of Krakow in, in her poems. Maybe I missed something, um, but, but Krakow is a place, place for literature. So many, so many writers live there. You mentioned uh, Szymborska, of course. Uh, Zagajewski, uh, Julian Kornhauser, Richard Krenicki, originally from Poznań, now lives in, in Krakow. Czesław Miłosz, when he decided to return to Poland, settled in, in Krakow. Uh, there is a whole community of, of writers there. Apart from Szymborska, one of her friends uh, was uh, uh, Stanisław Lem, the Polish, uh, the Polish science fiction writer. Uh, when we say science fiction writer, we mention some kind of, you know, entertainment, but he's actually very philosophical writer, uh, philosophical, uh, philosophical science fiction, uh, social science fiction. Uh, they were friends. There is a book of, uh, um, he, is, he is deceased now, uh, a book of the correspondence, very interesting correspondence. I think the interest in science and technology comes from, from, uh, from um, uh, LM. Uh, it, is, it is a place of literature, uh, especially you know, in the post-romantic era in the period when we call early modern era, you know, the um, turn of the century, uh, literary trends, Western literature, it all happened in Krakow. Uh, it was conductive to, to this, kind of, uh, this kind of life. So I believe, I believe yes, uh, it's a place that, and that writers gravitate to. It's a place of great interest. Uh, if, you, if our listeners ever go to Poland, Go to Krakow. Go to Warsaw too, of course, but but also go to Krakow. You won't regret it. Thank you. It is magical place, but Warsaw also the history and the magic. Yes, both also, rough at the edges, you know, unlike unlike Krakow, you know. Yes. So I'm looking at the Q and uh, a question and answers, and we have thank you from uh, Miss Mary Rose Kaczorowski. Thank you for the lecture. And from John Suzanski, thank you for your insightful introduction to Eva Lipska. Which poem or and a collection of her poems could you recommend? Any bilingual edition? Um, to an English leader or a Polish leader? That's the question. Um, th there are collections of poems uh, of her. I mean, the two that I mentioned, uh, Poet Criminal Madman is uh, the earlier, stage of her work and New Century is the later one. Both are great, uh, great collections. I, I recommend them. Uh, there are very, uh, there are at least two, two collect, uh, collections of her poems. One that uh, I highly recommend to Polish uh, readers is uh, Ewa Lipska, Nowy Wybór Bierzy, the new collection of poems uh, by uh, Wydawnictwo A5 publishers, A5 publishers, which is the publishing house of, uh, of uh, Ryszard Krynicki and his wife. This is a book, I think it's, you, 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 can, you can still, you can still uh, buy it. I think I bought it on, uh, on Amazon. Um, so, so these, you know, if you, if you want to give, give an overview of, uh, of, her, uh, of her poetry, um, that would be probably the best, the best places to start. Thank you so much, Professor Anders. It was amazing. All those three lectures were so rich and so insightful. Thank you very much. And a big thank you to Jarosław Anders for the wonderful and uh, insightful presentations. Well, you mentioned that you studied American literature in college. So I hope that this talk, the series of talks that you delivered uh, on the foundation's uh, well, Zoom platform uh, will we'll, we'll encourage uh, all our viewers who are watching us now, who watched our previous webinars and who will be watching us in the future, who will be watching the recordings of these webinars on our YouTube channel, will feel encouraged also to study and reach for the literature and the poets and the poetry of the Polish writers. That's the goal, that's the purpose. 
so once again, thank you very much. It was the pleasure to host you for our in during our in our our webinar series. Dr. Poshpik, thank you very much for the initiative and your involvement and contribution in our project. And thank you all who participated and to who, who waited <laughs> this pause, <laughs> this muted pause. Thank you very much for your patience and your uh, participation. We hope to host you for our upcoming uh, programs and webinars. The next one will be on the May 26th. Uh, without further ado, thank you once again. Wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>